Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Wenfei Fang of Northwestern University to the show, talking about her work studying kilonova explosions and collisions of neutron stars. But first, we're going to take a look at new findings showing the universe is getting hotter. And we'll examine the mysterious Blue Ring Nebula. Next, we'll journey back in time to the ancient solar system when a massive mega-flood ravished the surface of Mars. Finally, we will bid a sad farewell to one of the greatest telescopes in the world, as the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico is slated for demolition. The universe is growing hotter over time, a new study reveals. Researchers examining data from the Planck Space Telescope and the Sloan Sky Survey found the mean temperature of the universe has tripled since the first galaxies took shape. This is thought to be the result of massive tendrils of gas connecting galaxies together, drawing inward under the force of gravity. These intergalactic ribbons, known as the cosmic web, are the largest known structures in the universe. The Blue Ring Nebula, discovered in 2004, is centered on an unusual object. Although the star at its center seemed nondescript, a new study shows this body was born from a titanic collision. This nebula appears blue, although it does not give off any light of its own. Astronomers believe a pair of stars collided thousands of years ago, and the central body that is left is still settling down from its creation in its mammoth collision. An ancient flood on Mars may have taken place in the ancient past. This event, thought to have occurred nearly 4 billion years ago, would have forever shaped the region around Dale Crater. This region is known to have been home to vast quantities of water back in the age when Mars was still a water world. The Curiosity rover exploring Gale Crater since 2012 found ripples and rocks providing evidence for the ancient flood. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we welcome Dr. Izzat Hadari, Professor of Geoscience at Jackson State University to the show, talking about this fascinating study. The Arecibo Radio Telescope, one of the most important and beloved telescopes for astronomers over the last 57 years, is now slated for destruction. This revolutionary instrument was seen in numerous films and TV shows including Contact, GoldenEye, and The X-Files. In 1974, the Arecibo Telescope was used to send the most detailed message ever sent to other stars. A series of natural disasters since 2017, together with the failure of critical structural pieces on the telescope, has made the facility unsafe for astronomers, workers, and visitors. The National Science Foundation, which made the final decision, reports the telescope will be disassembled over the next few weeks. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. 
This week, we are happy to be joined by Wenfei Fong of Northwestern University, talking about her work studying powerful kilonova explosions and the collisions of ultra-dense neutron stars. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Wenfei Fong of Northwestern University. She's done some, she uh, is an, astro, an observational uh, astrophysicist who's done some fascinating work uh, discovering an extremely rare event called a kilonova explosion. Welcome to the show, Joe Wenfei. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit what is a kilonova explosion and how is it different from other forms of it? other eruptions like supernovae that people may be more familiar with? So kilonovae are extremely rare and they're fainter than our typical supernovae. So we, uh, d as a community, detect supernovae several times a week. Um, you know, amateur astronomers uh, can detect supernovae because they're very bright, those studying nearby galaxies. Uh, kilonovae a really interesting, much rarer class of explosions or phenomena, uh, about a hundred times fainter than your average type 1a supernova or core collapse supernova. Uh, and they're also uh, very rare, so about uh, uh, for what, every thousand supernovae, there's about one kilonova. So kilonovae up until 2017 were theorized uh, types of transients. They were totally um, you know, we, we never had any observational evidence for them. And uh, in 2017, there, were, there was a discovery where two neutron stars uh, merged and uh, we saw observational evidence of a kilonova that followed. And what a kilonova specifically is, is uh, the, an optical near-infrared signal powered by the radioactive decay of heavy elements produced in these rare neutron star mergers. It's basically two neutron stars on a collision course, they collide and, and give off a lot of light, one of which is a, one of these kilonovae. So they're, they're really special and rare. Uh, and one other thing that's interesting about kilonovae, the name actually comes from the fact that when they were first predicted, um, they're about a thousand times, predicted to be about a thousand times brighter than a nova. So it's like the kilonova aspect. Uh, yeah, yeah. But totally different than supernovae. Yeah. And so how does this most recent eruption compare to the one that was seen in 2017? Yeah, so great question. So um, actually before, so 2017 was a discovery um, from gravitational wave emission. And so that was actually um, a totally different type of way that we uh, discover these neutron star mergers. And uh, uh, gravitational wave facilities like LIGO and Virgo give us an opportunity to, uh, to see these um, gravitational, these neutron star mergers and the following kilonovae in gravitational waves and then optical and infrared light later on. Um, but for many decades, we've actually been studying these neutron star mergers in a totally different uh, view. So we've been studying them by uh, what are called gamma ray bursts. So just backing up a little bit, um, gamma ray bursts were detected first in the 1960s, uh, and then a series of gamma ray satellites have been launched uh, since. In 2004, NASA's SWIFT satellite was launched, and it detects these really high energy bursts of light called gamma ray bursts. Um, and we think these gamma ray bursts come from neutron star mergers. So every time we see one of these gamma ray bursts, um, uh, uh, we think a neutron star merger happened. Uh, it's a special type of class of gamma ray bursts called short duration gamma ray bursts. Um, there's another type of class associated with, with massive stars. But um, so every time we see one of these gamma ray bursts, which happens about a short gamma ray burst, which happens about once a month uh, that the SWIFT satellite detects them, uh, we go and try to look and point our telescopes. And in this case, a gamma ray burst happened signaling that a neutron star merger had happened. And we went and tried to look and train our, our telescopes to look for the optical infrared signal for the kilonova. And what made this um, kilonova uh, different than any other kilonova that's been detected is um, it was much brighter than we expected. 
and so about 10 times brighter than the kilonova discovered uh, in 2017, um, and 10 times brighter, brighter than any other, what we say, candidate kilonova that have been discovered in the past um, couple decades or so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, short, as you mentioned, you know, these short uh, duration gamma ray bursts mm -hmm. are rare, but they are seen. Um, yeah. So do you think that, um, do you have reason to believe that most or all of those events are the result of collisions between uh, neutron stars, or could there be other processes behind those events as well? Yeah, so this is a really um, interesting question because, uh, again, for, for decades we've been seeing these short gamma ray bursts, and we use con context clues to try to say, to kind of pinpoint their origin. So a lot of my work has been, you know, every time a short gamma ray burst happens, I go, I try to uh, localize it with telescopes by catching any fading emission I can. And then that, um, by looking at the fading light source, you can actually um, pinpoint it to a specific galaxy and place in the universe. You understand what type of galaxy did it come from? Did it come from a galaxy like the Milky Way? Did it come from a more uh, quiescent galaxy? Did it come from like a super starburst galaxy? So that um, we, we kind of use all these con and then where do they occur within their galaxies? So uh, and how often do they occur? So we use all these context clues to try to um, cross off viable progenitors until they're just like one viable um, origin left. And so we did this up until 2017, we're still doing this actually, but up until 2017 really built up a sample of these short gamma ray bursts, all these context clues to try to pinpoint them. And, and we thought they come came from either um, two neutron stars colliding or a neutron star in a black hole colliding, um, which we've actually never definitively seen before. Uh, but, but that would be really cool to actually see like a neutron star black hole uh, merger and uh, and a, a gamma ray burst after. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is, yes, we we think most of them come from neutron star mergers based on all these context clues. And the, the, uh, we have one definitive discovery in 2017 where definitely a, a neutron star merger happened and a gamma ray burst at the same time and a kilonova and everything else. Um, uh, so we have that one data point. And so we think most of them come from neutron star mergers, but uh, there could be other progenitors that might contribute a little bit, and potentially neutron star black hole mergers. So fabulous. And so, um, <clears throat> as I understand it, uh, the current under uh, the current belief is that uh, during the end product of most of these neutron star mergers are black holes. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, but this one did something a little different. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, and so this uh, so this was a short gamma ray burst detected by the Na NASA SWIFT satellite uh, back in late May, so May 22nd. So the event is 2005-22A, so it was 2020-05 uh, is May 22nd. Um, and then the first one on that was A, so that's um, May 22nd was detected. and. Um, you're right that most neutron star mergers, we probably think they they um, maybe temporarily form a you know hypermassive neutron star, but it's thought that under its own gravitational collapse will collapse to a black hole, and you don't really ever see um, uh, see anything else from from that black hole specifically. Um, but we think that this one, um, because the emission that we saw and that uh, we we initiated Hubble Space Telescope observations, um, and we think that the emission that we saw was from um, the, the uh, hypermassive neutron star that survived um, and acquired very large magnetic fields, um, and then that spin down energy from the magnetic field um, got deposited into the environment and basically caused the kilonova to grow even brighter. So we think that the um, two neutron stars probably created a, uh, a hypermassive neutron star or what we call a magnetar. So what is a magnetar and what is so unusual about these bodies? So magnetars are kind of scary objects. They're thought to be um, 
well, they're neutron, they're a special type of neutron star that have extremely high magnetic fields, extremely powerful magnetic fields. So many, many orders of magnitude higher than our Earth or Sun's magnetic field. You know, a, a lot of astronomical bodies have an inherent magnetic field, um, but these are expected to be um, extremely dense objects already that have extremely powerful magnetic fields. Um, and it's thought that during the merger process, when you have two neutron stars and they form this kind of uh, hypermassive or a larger neutron star, um, in that merger process, they can, uh, um, there can be instabilities that rise during the merger or uh, what we call a dynamo that's driven that basically amplifies a seed magnetic field to become really large. Um, and so these magnetars are probably very rapidly spinning um, because the merger has been basically imparted its spin on this nascent object. So it's really rapidly spinning and basically has these magnetic field lines that are whipping around. So it's, it's essentially a large source of untapped energy. Uh, and if that energy kind of is transferred to the surrounding environment, it can, um, it can make any kilonova or any outflow glow even, even brighter. So that's what we think we saw with this with this short gamma ray burst and this neutron star merger. And so why did this particular star um, collapse into a magnetar rather than a black hole? So it's thought that the normal outcome, of course, is um, two neutron stars. They're they're heavy enough that when they combine, uh, they will f they will collapse under their own weight and form a black hole. One thing that we don't quite understand is there could be um, some neutron stars just neutron star mergers just based on their um, based on their initial masses that might just meet the threshold. To, to, to not collapse under its own weight. So in other words, it could be, you know, on the massive end for a neutron star, but not quite enough to um, get to the level you need to collapse to a black hole. And one of the things we actually don't know is the mass difference between neutron stars and black holes. So like we don't know the maximum mass that a neutron star can attain. Um, and that's actually one thing, one of the central unanswered questions and understanding compact objects. Uh, and so it's possible that it created kind of a, a heavy, heavy neutron star that was spinning rapidly enough that it was able to um, withstand any uh, inward pull of gravity. Uh, but we don't expect it to be a really common outcome. But when, um, when it does happen, we should see uh, remnants of the surviving magnetar, so in the form of extra energy, uh, because normally when you, if you collapse to a black hole, all of that energy goes in to the collapse and you never see, never see it, um, whereas if a magnetar survives, you could see, you know, these extra energy deposited, uh, like we saw for, for this short gamma ray burst. Uh, and as the name suggests, they, um, these bodies have a tremendous magnetic field associated with them. Mm -hmm. What drives it? Yeah, so that's a, a, a good question. Um, we, we think every, almost every body has some nascent magnetic field, so like the Earth, the Sun. Um, and so these two neutron stars, they, they either um, were magnetized to begin with, even just a small um, seed magnetic field, but it's thought that when you actually um, inspiral on each other and get closer, there can be what we call magnetic instabilities that are driven at kind of the merger interface that can be amplified during this process. It's thought that if you have some small scale what we call turbulence that can drive um, what we call a dynamo effect that can really amplify the magnetic field to magnetar level proportions. Um, one thing is that we do actually have um, a population of magnetars in our own galaxy. So we do know that magnetars do exist. Uh, we don't exactly know, um, and, and we think actually most of the magnetars in our own galaxy were created um, from the core collapse of massive stars, uh, but we think maybe some small fraction could have been created in these, these mergers. Um, but yeah, that's essentially what drives the magnetic field uh, that we think at least. And you talked a little bit about um, how many heavy elements, including gold and uranium, are produced during these events. 
Um, how does the production of those elements uh, during Kilinova ex explosions compare to production from other means, and how is that how is that driven? Yeah, so we think, so we don't have any evidence necessarily that um, specific heavy elements were produced in this merger, um, but back in 2017 when we were able to get a spectrum of that particular kilonova, uh, we were able to uh, say that at least, um, you know, fit models to the data and say that probably heavy elements were produced. Um, so one thing that's uh, really interesting is that, you know, even growing up in my own astronomy classes, I was taught that core collapse supernovae, so the collapse of very massive stars, um, as well as type 1a supernovae, basically create all of the el elements um, iron and above, so heavier than iron. But um, we now think that kilonovae, um, they, they are rarer than supernovae, but they probably per event create more heavy elements. So it's kind of a, what well, we're not exactly sure, especially at the very heaviest elements, um, if kilonovae, neutron star mergers, or supernovae are dominant. Um, we think that, that kilonovae probably are, but I think future observations will help us understand um, how much they contribute to the heavy element budget. Um, and then for the lighter elements, those are created basically inside stars. Uh, so there's not too many Explode other types of explosions other than supernovae that we think contribute a lot to the heavy element budget. And so can you tell us a little bit about um, what future studies you'd like to see as well as ones you might even want to undertake yourself to learn more about GRB 2005, 22A, as well as other uh, kilonovae? Yeah, so I I think what what's really cool potentially about this discovery is um, it, it tells us that it's possible that two neutron stars can form a, a totally different new type of rare object, a magnetar. Uh, we haven't confirmed this yet, so this is just one of the scenarios uh, that we like the best to explain this, um, this very bright event. Um, but a future observations could be undertaken to try to confirm this scenario. So for instance, um, we think that if the magnetar uh, deposits energy into the surrounding kilonova material that can basically accelerate it, it looks um, bright in the infrared, which we saw infrared light, but also we think at later times maybe it will shine in radio light. Um, oh. So basically taking um, radio observatories like the Very Large Array, which um, was a site where Contact, Jodie Foster's movie was um, was filmed. So, I love that uh, Yes, and so we actually trained um, the Very Large Array on um, early observations of this, this particular gamma rainbow. So we think at later times, it could also reappear in the radio band. So that would be uh, pretty much confirmation that a, a magnetar was formed. So that's really exciting. Um, and then I think it just motivates us to, you know, every time a short gamma ray burst happens, to undertake these types of observations. Um, and other types of explosions are thought to produce magnetars in some form or another. It's always a kind of a rare scenario, but, you know, supernovae, we think the new field of fast radio bursts might be connected to magnetars. And so it's kind of neat that all these different types, seemingly different types of explosions might be, um, you know, have some underlying connection to these highly magnetized objects called magnetars. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It was great talking yes. with you. Yes, thank you so much. And yeah. that is, now is Dr. Wenfei Fong from Northwestern University. Next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we'll be joined by Dr. Izzat Hadari, Professor of Geoscience at Jackson State University. We'll discuss his work showing evidence for a possible mega flood on Mars in the ancient solar system. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. We depend on support from viewers just like you. 
To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Remember, it makes a great gift this year. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.